My name is Victoria Nesbitt, I'm a senior paediatric registrar at the John Radcliffe Hospital and I do Professor Paulton's mitochondrial clinic. Um, I was a clinical research associate in Newcastle for five years where I did my research into paediatric mitochondrial diseases and still get homesick. Um, they, I'm so grateful to um, the Lilly Foundation for asking me to speak today. I really, really do feel very honoured to be here um, and to be part of your weekend. Um, and I'm really grateful to you all for suggesting things that I should include in this talk. That was quite helpful for me. So hopefully we'll cover um, most or, or hopefully all of the things that you've wanted me to cover. And if not, there's the opportunity to ask questions at the end. So the things that I was asked to cover within this session um, were the importance of health surveillance, the importance of monitoring patients with mitochondrial disease, a little um, overview of the supplements that you may be familiar with, some uh, symptom specific medication. Now, I have done that, but obviously it's impossible to go through everything because certainly the, the vast majority of it will not be um, applicable to each and every one of you in the room, but I'm quite happy to answer any questions about that afterwards if needs be. And a bit about the ketogenic diet, both in terms of its um, use for intractable epilepsy and for PDH deficiency as well. So managing mitochondrial disease, it, it is still, I think, painful for us all and certainly more for more for you guys that there is no cure available for mitochondrial disease we are all working hard to try and change that but we're not there yet and therefore our management is on about the prevention of the disease the symptomatic man management of the disease and the support of management of the disease um, this is a slide that i used to base a talk around for the, for the climb um, parents group actually so that's the the children living with inherited metabolic disorders um, and these are the things we talked about. I'm not going to cover all of these things today because certainly Sister Feeney and um, Dr Gorman are talking about that, a lot of this in, in session three. But one thing I did want to mention is something called an education, health and care plan. Is that something that anybody with children have come across? It's, it's a relatively new thing. Um, certainly as clinicians, we're all s still getting to grips with it a little bit. It's different to a statement of special educational needs. Um, and it's for those young people under the age of 25 who need that bit more support than is covered in your statement of special educational needs, which in itself is changing title as well at the moment. So some of you will be going through that transition, I'm sure. Now, as a parent, you can ask for an assessment to be done. OK, so it doesn't have to come from your clinician. The requests go to your local authority. They can be done by you, by a nursery worker or carer, by somebody at the school if you've got an older child, or by your GP. That, that's not a problem. Um, the local authority have got six weeks to decide on whether or not to grant an assessment, and they've got relatively strict criteria as to who they do and don't grant assessments for. And if you do get an assessment, they've got 16 weeks to decide whether or not your assessment means that you should have um, a budget for additional care and what you choose to do with that budget is managed by you as a family so you can choose to pay for extra care for your child for um, extra respite for a support worker at school anything really you can choose to be the budget holder or you can allocate that to someone else but certainly the children that or the child and young people that I know who've got an EHC have found them hugely, hugely beneficial. So if you haven't thought about it, have a little think this weekend. The local authority will be loving me, won't they? <laughs> <laughs> Suggest that. <laughs> I have yeah, yes, I have yes, I've just wiped out the budget, <laughs> haven't I, for the next year, absolutely. So in terms of, um, of health surveillance, First and foremost is, is a clinic review and I think all of us that work in the mitochondrial clinic really love being there, genuinely love being there. We, we love seeing the families that come to the clinic, particularly because we're centred, well we're scattered aren't we really, across the country um, and you all travel usually quite a long way to get to, get to us. But it's a really helpful way for us to see disease progression because we don't see you very often it's sometimes easier for us to notice a decline 
which you'll know yourself, when you're with somebody day in, day out, it's sometimes difficult to see any subtle changes that are there. It's like your child growing. You know, you don't often realise that they're growing until their trousers are skimming their ankles. You know, it's, it, it, is, it is very helpful. As you know, we don't always, if, particularly if you're a local patient and you're on relatively regular reviews, maybe three monthly, you don't necessarily um, get examined every time, but it might be talking about what functional ability you've got, what social difficulties you've experienced, and how we, um, as the quaternary team, can then feed that back into your local paediatrician or GP to try and improve quality of life. I'm sure you'll all um, have had the disease rating scale performed at some point. Um, so there is the adult version, which is very well established, and our paediatric version, which comes in three different ages. And again, that's a prospective way for us to look at how disease patterns are changing um, in an individual and within a disease group. Um, it really appreciates the kind of multi-system nature of the disease. And even if you are somebody who has an isolated cardiac disease, for example, we still go through the full scale with you, um, partly to make sure that you haven't got any of the symptoms. Um, and secondly, because we're, we're interested in the impact on your quality of life. And certainly the, the disease rating scales have proved very useful in research studies. Blood tests, we don't just do blood tests for the sake of doing blood tests, there are reasons for us doing them, we'll talk about them a little bit more in screening. And essentially they are to detect um, treatable conditions. Okay, so even something as simple as anemia, which some of our children with mitochondrial disease have and can have a huge impact on their quality of life. You know, that feeling of if any, any of the mums out there became anemic during pregnancy, you know how much more tired you feel during that time. If we can treat that and make that small change, but actually it could have a huge, huge positive change on, on a child's life. So the blood tests are there to pick up any of the treatable conditions associated with mitochondrial disease. And again, it is a monitoring tool to look at any disease progression. ECG and echo. So ECG is your heart tracing. We have the sticky leads on your chest and it looks at the electrical activity of your heart. And an echo is the ultrasound scan of your heart to look at its contraction and blood flow. They are both tests that should be performed at diagnosis if they hadn't already been done in your investigation period, in your workup for mitochondrial disease. And then they should be done every year until we're happy that you've had a, a relatively long period of stability. Okay, so in the adult group, we say that they have annual echoes every year um, for three years, and then they can go on to two to three yearly echoes after that. Obviously, if in that time you start complaining of symptoms that could be related to that, you go right back to baseline. It's not quite as clear cut in the children. Um, we do tend to do them annually um, and then sometimes move to, to twice, um, to biannually, so, so every second year, just because the evidence out there for cardiac change in children is, is um, limited, really. Again, we do that to try and pick up any changes early to then slow the progression of uh, mitochondrial disease affecting the heart. EEG, so um, electroencephalogram, that's where you've got the stickies on your head this time. It looks at the electrical activity in your brain. That is something that we tend to just do in people who have seizures or have episodes of encephalopathy. So those periods when you are acutely confused, completely out of character, um, those are the patients that, that get EEG. EEGs are not necessary um, as a routine screening tool. Similarly, nerve conduction studies, if anybody's had nerve conduction studies themselves, they'll know they're a little bit uncomfortable. Um, so it's a little bit, it's an, again, there's, there's, some, there's some nods going on. Um, it's a bit like you have a little needle put into whichever part of the body we're trying to test, and it's a little electric shock. And what we're looking at is how fast the nerves transmit their electrical signals to one another and it can help us detect something called neuropathy which we know is associated with some forms of mitochondrial disease um, so that we can manage that condition better. Now with a neuropathy and I'll talk about this a bit a bit later there are some um, treatable causes of neuropathy, neuropathy which are probably not related to mitochondrial disease but it's always worth if you've got a diagnosis of 
of neuropathy, checking things like your nutritional status is optimum. So do you get adequate vitamins? So that's one of the main causes of neuropathy. Um, so it's always worth checking that. So we know my, uh, mitochondrial disease is associated with neuropathy, but lots of other things are too. And I think that's, that's often the, the trick when we see you in clinic is trying to decide, is this because of your mitochondrial disease or is it something else? Just because you've got mitochondrial disease, unfortunately, doesn't mean you can't get anything else. And I think that's often the problem with when children are labelled with mitochondrial disease, everything gets attributed to that everything and then you are potentially missing things that could be treated um, and could Im improve um, your quality of life. Respiratory function test again should be done at diagnosis and on an annual basis in the smaller children it's far more difficult to do in an older child or adult with a cognitive ability um, to understand what we're, we're asking them we get them to blow into a tube essentially and we can look at their lung function so if you remember it's not just your lungs, taking you right back to school now, it's not just your lungs that are instrument in your work of breathing, it's your diaphragm as well. So you've got a big flat muscle that sits down here and that helps expand your lungs. The diaphragm is a big muscle. So if you have got mitochondrial disease, your diaphragm can potentially be affected. Um, so that's why we start to look at, at respiratory function tests. Eye tests, again, you should have a full um, ophthalmological examination at diagnosis um, and probably annually thereafter um, excluding the patients who've got labours they're a separate group entirely, uh, entirely. Um, we also look at visual field testing which again is a little bit more tricky to do it's got a bit more involvement but in children who have seizures who have neurodevelopmental difficulties or uh, suffer from periods of encephalopathy, then actually it's quite important to have your visual fields tested um, at regular intervals. And video uh, fluoroscopy really is a fairly specific test, um, looking at your, whether or not you've got a safe swallow, essentially. Um, and we do this in children where there appears to be some deterioration in their swallow, so they may have managed normal diet, but then suddenly are gagging or choking on certain fluids usually um, or if you've ended up with a pneumonia so a chest infection because you've choked on food so why do we bother monitoring you well like I've already alluded to there it is to screen for treatable conditions um, we know there are lots of complications of mitochondrial disease or associations with mitochondrial disease and if we can um, slow their progression um, or keep um, them controlled then all the better it is. I'm just going to bring them all up rather than wait for them all to come out and then we can talk about them. Now certainly in the research that I did with the, the children with mitochondrial disease, diabetes is not a common presenting feature at all. In adults, often you'll find that there are a lot of adults, particularly in our maternally inherited group, where diabetes is a big feature. It is not a feature um, in the younger children at all. We tend to find that once the children are going into puberty, and puberty is usually delayed in our children with mitochondrial disease, um, and into young adults that that's when we start to see the signs of diabetes however that's not to say that it can't occur and that's why we monitor for it because again that's a really important treatable not curable but treatable condition that needs to be addressed some people require insulin some people can be dietary managed or controlled with um, sulfonylureas which is a tablet essentially and there's fairly strict guidelines from the World Health Organization about the management of diabetes and that is just as applicable to people with mitochondrial disease. It doesn't matter that you've got diabetes because of your mitochondrial disease, you've got diabetes. You should be monitored in the same way as all of the other people with diabetes. Renal failure is something that we do sometimes see in our children, um, not particularly in one disease group more than another. But again, that's something that your blood test would start and pick up on, and it's something that we can prescribe medication for to slow the progression. 
In the extremes, then you are looking at things like dialysis or maybe even a transplant. Um, just because your child has got mitochondrial disease does not mean they cannot have an organ transplant, but every child is different. It depends on how much you are affected and which other organs are involved. There's lots of things to think about when it comes to transplant, not just the organ itself, but in terms of your care both before, during and after your surgery, combined with the anaesthetics that are used um, and combined with the medications that you have to take after you've had a transplant. Similarly for cardiomyopathy, um, both for an isolated cardiomyopathy or a multi-system disease, it could be slowed, the progression of it could be slowed with medication, which is why you do, can you manage which is why we do ECGs and echoes and listen in to your heart. Um, some children or adults do go on to require surgery. So a VAD, I don't know if anybody's either got a VAD, had a VAD, um, or is aware of a VAD, so it's a ventricular assist device. And essentially it's uh, an external heart that does the beating of the heart for you, either to give you some recovery or as a bridge to transplantation. And we've had children who've, who've had VADs and transplants. And transplant, like we've just talked about for, for kidney transplants, there are lots of factors to take into consideration. But mitochondrial disease per se does not preclude you from having a transplant. Cardiac conduction blocks, so that's when your, the electrical rhythm of your heart goes all over the place, does things it shouldn't, beats at funny times, stops beating for a bit. And again, that can pick up very easily on ECG, certainly. I will never, ever forget um, one of our girls who's not here, um, who used to complain about everything, all sorts of things, but failed to complain about the fact that she was short of breath on exertion or couldn't walk up the stairs at home anymore. And she had her ECG whilst in clinic. Bobby had seen her actually, her pulse felt a little bit funny. He thought, mm, we'll just get your ECG done today. It was booked for the following week. And sure enough, she was in complete heart block and had surgery the following day. Those things can be picked up and treated and are important. Um, lactic acidosis, I'm sure the majority of you in this room are aware of what is the buildup of acid, which is secreted from your muscles. We check that in your blood, not just when you are acutely unwell. When we're all unwell, our lactic acid probably goes up a bit, but particularly people who have got mitochondrial disease, um, and we, it, it can make you really unwell, you know, it, can, it could be as much as being a bit sick, as in vomiting, to being severely unwell and ending up in the intensive care unit. Um, so monitoring that both when you're well and unwell is really important. Um, I've just put in brackets there about dichloroacetate. There's lots and lots of previous research about dichloroacetate for lactic acidosis. It does change your lactic acid levels it doesn't affect your long-term outcome but what they did find was that you can end up with an irreversible peripheral neuropathy so damage to your nerves and your hands and your feet that can't be reversed so uh, as a general rule we don't use it in the pediatric group there are some exceptions to that and depression depression is something we are seeing more and more um, particularly in our young adults um, and understandably so. So you have the impact of living with a disease like mitochondrial disease um, and I think it's perfectly acceptable to expect people to feel low in mood because of that. But in addition to that we actually think there is a biological component that predisposes you to depression as well and that's something that again the rating scales that we use um, in clinic can help us detect that. We're still, we still live in a society where we're not terribly good at um, both recognising mental health problems or dealing with them. Um, and I think sometimes people don't really want to say that they've been feeling of low mood or worse, yet when they do their disease rating scale, they'll quite happily tick the box that applies to them. And again, that's, that's quite important for us to know about that so that we can try and help. So what else do we do? We've talked about 
um, improving and maintaining life. So this is the supportive side of, of what we do. And this is predominantly delivered by our multidisciplinary care team. So our speech therapists, our occupational therapists, our physiotherapists, but also um, orthotics, so people who need uh, insoles or splints in their shoes, um, and with psychology, who again are, are forming more and more um, part of our team. If any of you have looked at the uh, Newcastle Mitochondrial website before, there is a bit that says it's for, for clinicians, but it's not restricted at all, so anybody can access them. And there are a, a, a set of care guidelines, similar to the NICE guidelines that exist for many other conditions. These were written by uh, a lot of the people that are here today, um, and a lot of people who aren't here today as well, who work in the field of mitochondrial disease, who have put together these guidelines to try and help people who don't live near one of our centres so that if you present to your local hospital, they are easily accept, uh, accessible for your local care team to have a look at and have a look and see, should we be doing this? Should we avoid that? That's primarily that. There are at-a-glance versions. The full guidelines are fairly lengthy, um, but there are at-a-glance versions, which are literally two pages long. You can read them in about five minutes. They are adult based and Bobby and I are working on a paediatric set. But again, um, evidence really up to now has been a bit more limited for the children. But that is something we're working on and hopefully with some of the research I did in Newcastle. I had that flashing on the bottom because I knew I'd forget about it. Um, everybody should be getting their flu and pneumococcal vaccines. OK, I know they just released, didn't they, in the press today that they, they um, it wasn't terribly <laughs> effective this last year. The, the, the um, efficacy of it went down. That we would still recommend that people get it. And actually, as a primary carer of somebody with mitochondrial disease, you should really think strongly about having your flu vaccine. Certainly, we all do. You should actually be flagged up on your GP's list. But if you're not, then just has to be added on. So supplements. Coenzyme Q10, CoQ10, ubiquinone, they're the, they're the, the, the uh, terms by which it's used. We know it has got a role in people who have a primary ubiquinone deficiency. That was proven both in the lab um, and seems to be the case in the, the early clinical studies that have been done. However, because of what they saw in those studies, they thought, well, actually, why is it not? We know that everybody's a bit deficient in CoQ10 if you've got mitochondrial disease, so why does it not benefit everyone? We don't know is the answer. But often, if fatigue is a big problem associated with your mitochondrial disease, you will be offered a trial of CoQ10, OK? It's essentially a vitamin. It's a supplement. Side effect-wise, I think probably the most common side effect that people experience, if any, and it it is unusual that people get side effects, is a little bit of um, tummy upset, essentially. Now, for some people, it's just it lasts just a few days and then it kind of passes and they can tolerate it. For others, it's not, and it's just not manageable at all. It upsets their gut too much for them to see really any benefit. And I think, it, yeah, if fatigue is a big problem, both in children and in adults, then it is certainly worth a trial. And that's something that... Um, as a general rule, will be prescribed from your mitochondrial centre, be it Newcastle, Oxford or London. Some of the GPs or local hospitals will prescribe it, um, but it costs them to do it, whereas we have a licence to do it, so it doesn't impact on anybody else if we supply it. So um, if you are interested in having a trial of CoQ10, then speak to one of the team the next time you're at clinic. Riboflavin, um, so again, another kind of vitamin type supplement that we will often add, particularly when we're asked to see the neonates, so the newborns um, who are suspected of having a metabolic condition or a mitochondrial disorder. We will start them often on a concoction of vitamins and supplements just in case. One, because we know that the side effect profile is so low it is unlikely that we would do them any harm by starting them and two because we know that the benefits of starting those um, supplements early could have a profound impact particularly if the children end up having a complex one deficiency diagnosed riboflavin is thought to have a cardioprotective effect 
if you don't have a complex one deficiency, then riboflavin won't be of any benefit to you. Thiamine, for anybody who's got a PDH deficiency, um, you're most likely to be on thiamine, and we'll talk about thiamine a little bit later. Um, it's a, uh, associated with the B vitamins, um, and that's something that's really important if you've got PDH deficiency and are on the ketogenic diet. L-arginine is something that is debated quite a lot between the mitochondrial centres. So there is some evidence that would suggest that if you are somebody has, that has stroke-like episodes, that L-arginine could be of benefit to you when you present acutely and thereafter to um, lessen the frequency of your stroke-like episodes. Um, I have minimal experience with L-arginine personally and speaking to the Newcastle team just this week about it. I know they use it quite a lot in London, so if you're under the Queen Square team, they, are, they often use L-arginine in their 3243 patients. In Newcastle, we used it recently um, with no effect at all. So granted, N equals one, but the jury's still a bit out on that. Now, these next ones I've put in this box because there are, they are supplements that have been well described previously. Um, but recent reviews suggest that they have no positive impact in mitochondrial disease. Okay, so dichloroacetate we've talked about before, that's to do with your lactic acidosis. Um, levocarnitine, um, which moves some of the fatty acids into the mitochondria, certainly in laboratory studies, um, but just doesn't seem to do the same in real life. Um, and creatine, which anybody who's into fitness and bodybuilding and things will probably have, have heard of. And again, you can see why people thought it would be of benefit. If you want to improve your muscle strength, add a bit of a protein into it and things should get better, but that wasn't the case um, and, and potentially could cause harm. Recent trials. Um, so Professor Chinnery up in Newcastle, who looks after a lot of the patients with mitochondrial disease, and particularly people with labours, so that's a condition that predominantly affects your eyes, um, looked at iodebanone, um, and although their primary outcome measure wasn't proven, their secondary outcome measures were, and certainly there is some improvement in visual acuities using this. It's a hugely expensive drug, but if you are losing your vision and you know there's a drug there, then if you are seen at one of our centres, you will almost certainly get it. Coenzyme Q10, we've talked about, and this is the bit I alluded to earlier, there was some good work by Ian Hargreaves from London that suggested that if your mitochondrial DNA were depleted, um, that your CoQ10 levels were low, therefore by replacing it, you could have some clinical improvement, and that's the rationale for using CoQ10. And I'm sure the majority of you in this room, particularly if you've got children with uh, Lee's disease, will have heard about the EPI 743 trial, which was run in America. It first came to light, I think probably four-ish years ago now at the, at the UMDF conference. Um, and it, it was being publicized as we have a cure for Lee's disease. Um, they had six, I think, patients in their trial and yes, a couple of them did show improvement, but there was a lot of flaws in their methodology. They subsequently went on to do a control trial, um, the results of which are due this year, and they've moved on to the second phase of their study, looking at the long-term effects of this drug um, on things like development, um, hospital admissions, cognition, mortality, um, to see whether or not there is any proven benefit. It's still an American-run trial. Uh, the year before last, they did look at incorporating some of the European centres, but to my knowledge, that didn't take off. It's a bit of a watch this space, I think, for that one. Drugs to be used with caution. Again, when you're first diagnosed with mitochondrial disease, it is likely that in the letter to your GP, you were given a list of drugs of saying don't use or avoid. Some people get a little bit of a shock because they're drugs that they're already on. 
Um, generally, what we would do is say you are, particularly in the adult group, if you have had non-insulin dependent diabetes and you've been on metformin for a long time and your diabetes is controlled, we probably wouldn't change you over onto something else, but we would be extra vigilant as to the side effects that you could get. Um, so that's predominantly by looking at your blood tests. Valparate is something that should be uh, avoided sorry, in the children with Alpers disease. Um, so the Polgy mutation causing Alpers disease because we know it can cause huge liver problems in them. What we try and do is, um, in neurology, what we try and do is the young children, so the preschool age group who are presenting with difficult to control seizures with a possible metabolic disorder, we just don't prescribe it. Valparate is a fantastic drug for controlling epilepsy, but if you are suspecting a metabolic disease and you haven't got to that diagnosis yet, we just don't use it as a general rule because it's just not worth the risk. Linezolid and, um, is an antibiotic. Um, it's not a first line, it's not something your GP would give you, it's something that you would get if you were in hospital um, and you were sick with some of the more obscure bugs, generally. Um, so it's probably not one that most people need to worry about. Gentamicin, however, at the bottom, is something that's much more commonly prescribed. Um, and I think generally in mitochondrial disease we would adhere to a little bit of caution with anybody, but it would be absolutely avoided in anybody who's got the 1555 mutation because it causes deafness. So symptom specific medications. Seizures are a big part of a lot of um, the lives of our children with mitochondrial disease. There are lots and lots of drugs now that are suitable for seizures. Um, and it partly depends on your type of seizure. So if you have a generalised epilepsy or if you have a focal epilepsy um, or if you have a focal epilepsy that goes on to be a generalised epilepsy, there are different, disease, uh, different drugs sorry, that we think help different ways. But there are some that we use a little bit more commonly, I suppose. Um, Levetiracetam or Keppra is one that a lot of you will be familiar with. Keppra is a good broad spectrum anticonvulsant that can often be used um, in isolation by itself. Um, it can help in some of our adults who've got myoclonus, so twitchy muscles essentially as well. So it has some benefit for them. Clobazam is uh, something that we use as an add-on. So it wouldn't be your, or it's unlikely to be your only anticonvulsant, but if you're on a baseline anticonvulsant and you're still having breakthrough seizures, then clobazam is something that we uh, consider adding, particularly if you're troubled with, or your child is troubled with cluster seizures. So they might be fine for a long period of time, and then over the next few days or weeks, they just have multiple seizures, and clobazam is something we would consider them. Clonazepam is another one which I haven't put on there. And again, um, it's a good um, anticonvulsant that's often used as an adjunct to others, but it can have some benefits both with myoclonus and with dystonia. So if you're somebody who's troubled with seizures and dystonia, then clonazepam is maybe a drug that we'd consider. And the ketogenic diet we'll talk about a little bit more in a bit. Stroke-like episodes are most commonly associated with the 3243 mutation, but can occur in other genotypes, and we've talked about arginine. Um, there are lots of studies, so um, Dr Whitaker, who is our neurophysiologist up in Newcastle, has done a lot of work looking at people with migraines um, and whether or not they are more likely to go on to develop stroke-like episodes. Um, is there a way that you could intervene and prevent that progressing on to that? Um, but as of yet, we still have no real symptom-specific medication that is definitively proven. Drooling and excess secretions. So those of you who have got children um, in whom this is a problem know that it can be a big problem. Um, I think until you've experienced it, you perhaps don't realise how much of a, a, a burden it can be, I suppose, and how much it can impact on the child's quality of life. The two drugs that we specifically use are hyacinth patches, and I've seen lots of children today who've got what looks like a little lastoplast behind their ears. That's a hyacinth patch or glycopyrrolate, which is a medication. Um, it's a little bit of trial and error, to be honest. It's what works for you as a child, what works for you as a family. Um, I spoke to a family in clinic this week who said they much preferred glycopyrrolate because it meant when their child was unwell, they could just reduce the dose of glycopyrrolate. So 
it thickens your secretions um, and they, they found it easier to manipulate. Other people don't think glycopyrrolate works and much prefer the patch. <coughs> Pros and cons to everything. Neither are mitochondrial disease specific. Movement disorders. Um, so a big, a big problem for our, a lot of our children and particularly I would say those who've got nuclear inherited problems. Um, baclofen is a very commonly used drug um, and for some children it will progress to intrathecal, uh, intrathecal so that's going in through your spine. Um, there are a lot of considerations to be made before that is considered and there are only certain centres in the UK that would consider that. Other things that you might be familiar with are trihexyphenidyl. Are you okay? Sure. Trihexyphenidyl, um, which again can be helpful. Do you want the air conditioning on? I can see a lot of fanning going on. Oh, um, trihexyphenidyl is something that is often used. Uh, not often used, sorry, as a, an agent after baclofen. Now, reflux, I think, is probably under-recognised in children. So if you have got low tone um, and perhaps if you are fed um, nasogastrically or orally, then you are much more likely to get reflux. And again, huge, huge impact on your quality of life. Um, so we do try, and again, not mitochondrial specific, um, any children with a newer disability that affects their tone and their feeding. Um, if you think your child is uncomfortable, particularly when lying flat, if they seem to regurgitate um, their food or um, burp frequently or have a lot of secretions post meals then these are things that we start thinking about um, with regards to reflux. Reflux can be bad enough that you require surgery but again that's something that needs to be done with quite a lot of careful planning and consideration. Constipation is a huge problem in our disease group. I'm not expecting you all to start nodding your heads now. Um, but it is a big problem and again the impact that it has on your quality of life is huge it can just make you feel generally rubbish um, and if you're a non-verbal child trying to actually tell your parents or carers that that's a problem is almost impossible it's really important to have regular bowel opening and we we if any of you come to the newcastle clinic we always tease Catherine actually because um, Catherine loves talking about constipation so more of a call is generally what we use only because it's much gentler on the bowel as opposed to senna or lactulose which can have a really profound effect and cause a huge fluid loss so have caution with senna particularly. Cardiactive function we've talked about. I'll try and talk a bit quicker. Aids and adaptations. Um, what I will say about postural support is I think we're where generally I think local paediatricians are very good at um, referring for postural support but sometimes what's not thought about is the different times of the day so just because your seat is the right seat for you socializing or developing does not mean it's the right seat for feeding um, and almost certainly won't be the right seat for you getting out and about so it is well worth having an experienced occupational therapist involved in your child's care to make sure they've got appropriate seating for appropriate circumstances Again, I've just cost them a fortune, so they're going to love me, aren't they? Um, tube feeding, nasogastric tube feeding, gastrostomy tube feeding, and jejunostomy. Gastrostomy and jejunostomy are both surgical procedures, um, longer term, and um, often it's worth considering, it, considering early. Nocturnal um, respiratory assistance or non-invasive ventilation. This mask that you can see going on there. Again, this is becoming more common in our adult groups, actually. Um, so particularly if they are complaining of daytime tiredness, headaches and actually we do with their respiratory function tests and we see that particularly when they lie flat that the um, efficiency of their diaphragm is relatively reduced and it can, can really improve the quality of life. Hearing aids, lots of people here today with hearing aids, variety of type, they're not like the old fashioned ones used to be that were so obvious, you know there are some very very discreet um, hearing aids. And cochlear implants is becoming more um, 
recognised as being a potential. So these are for children who've got a severe sensory neural hearing loss. Um, you're not guaranteed to, again, it's a fairly expensive process to go through. You are not guaranteed to be accepted for an implant just because you have severe bilateral sensory neural hearing loss. There are some um, provisors to that. Certainly one of the families that we have who aren't, aren't here today, um, their little boy has a really severe movement disorder and it often involves his hands coming up to his head and a cochlear implant involves a magnet behind your ear and they deemed that he wasn't suitable for cochlear implant because his movement disorder wasn't controlled enough to prevent the implant being knocked, which was a, a really, well, it was devastating actually for his family. Props. Um, again, often our adult patients with ptosis prefer props to surgery and I would say our younger females prefer surgery compared to props for cosmetic reasons. Okay, so let's talk about the ketogenic diet there's been a lot of uh, a lot of chat I would say in the on parent forums and um, other websites to do with the ketogenic diet and whether or not it's suitable in mitochondrial disease historically we have always said that the ketogenic diet is not suitable for mitochondrial disease ketogenic diet is a way of altering the proportions of your fats to non-fats your non-fats are your proteins and your carbohydrates um, if you manipulate the diet, you can um, train your body to produce something called ketones and then your body uses the ketones instead of glucose as a fuel for energy. The ketogenic diet is high in fat, has an adequate amount of protein to optimise growth and that's really important in our children um, with low carbohydrate. It is essentially trying to mimic a fasting state a starvation state in the body okay that's what you're trying to do it must not ever be undertaken without specialist supervision particularly in children with mitochondrial disease because the effects could be devastating if you get it wrong um, it is under resourced in this country there's no doubt about it it is a recommended alternative epilepsy therapy now and it's causing a huge problem. So it's there in the NICE guidance. If you've tried a certain number of anticonvulsants or you are suitable for a ketogenic diet, you should be referred. Certainly in Oxford, our waiting list is nine to 12 months at the moment. We have one dietitian looking after the whole region. Um, we've just got funding for another dietitian, which will massively um, change um, the lives of a lot of our families but it is a huge problem. Newcastle are slightly better resourced for it. I'm not sure about London, um, but it is a big, big problem. Uh, I know there are people here who are on a ketogenic diet, and I think probably they're far better to talk about the pros and cons of it from a practical purpose than I am. It does take a lot of time and effort. It's about getting your ratios right. There's a lot of scales and mixing and proportions um, some people can just do it and they have no problems with the practical sense of it and it works for their family and that's great some people just can't um, i think particularly if you've got a big family a child or more than one child with a disability um, or have a generally relatively chaotic life it, it, it's much more difficult for you to do um, but certainly there are people that you can talk to about the practicalities of it um, Like I've said, it is an established therapy for intractable epilepsy. The difficulty has come in that a lot of the children with mitochondrial disease have got intractable epilepsy. It's not controlled with medication. Parents are looking for something else. And actually, I think boundaries are starting to be loosened as to whether or not we offer the ketogenic diet. But I really can't stress enough, it must be done under really close supervision and you must have access to a specialist dietitian and a paediatrician who is used to dealing with certainly severe epilepsies or the ketogenic diet. With regards to PDH deficiency, um, again, there is evidence that it works for a pyruvate dehydrogenase deficiency. Um, because of the manipulation of the diet, you are you must be on thiamine so a lot of our children with pdh deficiency are on thiamine anyway 
but if you're on a, PDH def a, a ketogenic diet and you are PDH deficient, it's really important. Again, you will become symptomatic if you are deficient in your thiamine. This is going slow now, isn't it? It's something that in this country, there is still relatively little experience in. Um, there aren't many children in this country with PDH deficiency, full stop, but particularly on the ketogenic diet. Um, it's something that we're learning more about and as more families um, are on it, again, we can see the, the positives and the common pitfalls, I suppose, that are on it. The little bit I've put on the bottom there about the, the fast and fluid restriction is usually when you start a ketogenic diet, we fast you for a period and we restrict your fluids to try and starve your body to start off the process. We don't do that in the children with, with PDH deficiency because we know it can be harmful to them. You often need a relatively long time on your ketogenic diet to see any clinical benefit and that's often the rate limiting step for families. It's getting to that point though, isn't it? Because when you first started, I think you think, oh my goodness, what have I done? <laughs> good. Yeah, that's good. But you can, I'm sure you can understand how a lot of families just can't tolerate it. It, it. it takes a lot of time and effort, doesn't it? And if you've got that, that's great. If you haven't got that, it doesn't mean you're a worse parent. It's just not suitable for your family, just in the same way as some of the anticonvulsant drugs aren't going to be suitable for your child. It's the same concept. But it does take a lot of getting your head round, I think, doesn't it? Matthew's Friends and Daisy Garland are two well-established um, charities in this country that specifically give advice on the ketogenic diet. If you're from around this kind of area, Matthew's Friends particularly are, are somebody who often um, help out 